Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, joined today by Re- Rebecca McMahon Giles. Did I say it right? I asked you and then I forgot. <laughs> so I'm very sorry. Um, Rebecca is the author of a book called A Young Writer's World Creating Early Childhood Classrooms Where Authors Abound um, that I, uh, I read early summer, I think, and we've kind of been talking about you coming on and trying to get it scheduled for a while now. So welcome. Thank you. It's nice to uh, be here. Yeah. What would you like folks to know about you before we jump into talking about your book? Um, let's see. I guess I'm an early childhood educator at heart, and um, that is my passion, actually working with young children. And I am currently at the university where I work with training future teachers to work with young children, but get back into the classroom, usually through teacher training grants or even just volunteering as much as possible Mm -hmm. um, to have that time with three, four and five year olds. They, they teach you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I just moved from a job where I was more directly with children in the mornings. And now I'm just at the college by myself with grownups and usually those grownups are on a screen right now and I miss it so much. I, I can't wait to be able to find ways to get back in with children. So um, I, before we jump in with a starting quote, I want to thank you for the book. I feel like um, literacy, of course, is always a topic and people always want to talk about reading and teaching reading. Um, but there really aren't that many books out there that I've seen that really focus on the piece of helping children become writers. So, um, so I'm excited. I think I told you I'm going to try and use it in a literacy class I'm teaching later this semester. I'm excited about it. I do think that we as um, parents and teachers and just kind of a society in general, recognize the importance of um, teaching reading and teaching our children a love for reading. Mm -hmm. And we have um, gotten the message through, I think, that we need to begin early and often and very casually and um, just making it a part of our daily routine, the exposure to books and reading. Mm -hmm. But we haven't done such a good job with getting that message to the writing, yeah. which um, it's equally important. It's just not emphasized. Right. I mean, other than like name writing, we, we yeah. tend to really, really want to see that happen and practice that whether we're parents or, or teachers with young children, but, but the depths that you go to in the book, we sometimes oh, and don't, don't um, get to. And the common misconception that occurs between the terms uh, writing and handwriting yeah. So for me, writing is definitely not penmanship. Yeah. Handwriting and penmanship are synonymous. And you're talking about legibility and fluency. And those criteria relate to putting marks on paper. But yeah. when you're talking about writing, it's all about self- self-expression. Uh-huh. And the emphasis is on communication regardless of the form that that might take. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you say that very early in the book, it's not a manual on teaching handwriting. It's um, it's a guide to help nurture young children's writing as a means of communication. And I love that, that, um, that discussion of, of the ultimate goal right early in the book. Um, Because when I said there isn't a lot out there about writing, there are handwriting curriculums. There are, you can get, yeah, but that's not what you've written here. No. And, um, it's a different focus. And if we think um, handwriting is functional, functional writing, um, where I want to focus on more expressive writing. Uh-huh. So more than just um, being able to write your name, but being able to really communicate your thoughts and ideas. And that's why I, I use the word author repeatedly, helping children become authors as opposed to just writers, helping them realize that they have something worth saying in a more permanent form than orally. It's worth putting it down on paper. Um, and in doing that, it it gains some power because it gains some, some permanence and some importance. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that, that I thought was great, um, you, you talk about having a publishing center in the classroom. So we all kind of have our writing area, right? Most of us do where we have 
the pencils and pens and the notebooks and paper and the things that are on all of our regulatory lists and our, our accreditation criteria. Um, but what's different from between a publishing center and a writing center, the way we would um, traditionally see it? For me, again, it's just the perspective. And so most of us do not have a reading center. We have a classroom library because books are everywhere. And there are counting books in the math center and there's nonfiction text in the science discovery center. And reading is a part of everything that we do, but there's kind of a concentrated focus on reading in the library. So I want that same emphasis for writing. Writing isn't something that's done in a little corner or a designated space, but you write around the room as a part of children's play and their um, learning in blocks and in science and in math, but there can be a designated space for publishing mm -hmm. where um, if you specifically want to work on your craft as an author, or if you need quick access to book making supplies, then there's a space for that. But um, writing isn't, um, isolated or it isn't, it isn't, it doesn't happen just in that one spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We really, um, we really try to compartmentalize children sometimes. Um, and we do it, I think, because with good intentions, like we want to make sure we're offering something for every piece of their development, but we forget that it happens in such connected ways. Like it's when you're in the block area and you want to make a sign or you want to write, um, a note to somebody it, when you're playing in a pretend play, dramatic play area, or you want to tell a story about the, the art that you've done, those kinds of things. I, and so I think um, one of the main goals of the book is to help teachers realize, first of all, the importance of having um, writing utensils and writing materials in every aspect mm -hmm. of the classroom, and then how to make that happen. So they recognize the necessity that it be available. And then just some, some tips, some ideas for um, what types of materials and storage and how to rotate them in and out to maintain inter mm -hmm. interest and to better relate to the curriculum or the theme of current study. Yeah, I was just teaching, one of the classes I'm teaching this semester is about cognitive curriculum. And uh, I mean, that's the name of the class. And we were talking about science last week and we looked at like the, the school supply catalog section on science and all the materials you can have about science. Um, and, and we talked about how you can, have, you can have all the stuff on the shelves that your budget can buy, but if you yourself don't understand how each piece relates to science, it's not going to be uh, as rich an experience for children. And would you say the same is kind of true with the, the writing? You know, you just you just described having materials kind of all over the room. Definitely. I think that um, first and foremost, we have to create learning experiences for our children that are worthy of being written about. Mm -hmm. So they have to have a, a topic of interest, something that they're excited to share. And then we need to have the um, materials in place and the support system to help them share that in, in writing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm saying writing, but that writing could be any form of kid writing. It could be scribbling. It could be random letters. It can be dictation. Mm -hmm. It can be their oral words that are um, actually um, transcribed by an adult in writing. Yeah. And then publishing is another term that I use differently, I think, more um, than a lot of people. And I use it more... Um, developmentally uh -huh. um, for a number of years I taught the writing process and how we teach writing and we go through the five steps and um, I associate that whole view of um, pre-writing and drafting and revising and editing and publishing with Donald Graves and Donald Graves is a uh, a personal favorite of mine mm -hmm. and he just did wonderful work in the area and the pedagogy of teaching writing but when I tried that with our youngest learners it wasn't it wasn't as effective um, for a number of reasons but mainly because developmentally they're different 
I mean, they have short attention spans. They, um, they don't understand time well. Um, they lack fine motor skills. Mm -hmm. They um, are egocentric. And so this delayed gratification where you revisit one piece of work so that the, it makes more sense to the reader and you do it over an exterior, over an extended period of time um, was just more difficult for them. Mm -hmm. And so they need the end, they need the final step, which is the publishing or the sharing, because that's where the acknowledgement and the recognition comes. And it takes that acknowledgement, it takes the constructive feedback that they get from a reader to provide both the motivation to continue writing, as well as um, increased knowledge about mm -hmm. writing and, and how it works. And so for me, publishing is any writing that's read. If it is shared, it is published. So um, it, it doesn't have to be perfected. It doesn't have to be revised and edited. And eventually we will, we will get there, but it is that, um, one step writing or first draft writing or writing that is immediately read that elicits a response that is going to keep them writing and also help them improve as writers. Mm -hmm. That's such a good, um, I guess, unpacking of how it's like, like everything else when we're working with children this age, it's the process um, that is, is more important for this age group than the product. Some of the time, like they're going to love that product and you're getting them to the product quicker by changing your, your process there with, with about publishing, but it's really about what did I communicate? How did it feel for me to communicate that? How did someone else respond to it when I published it? Whatever that means of public publishing is. Um, I think that really fits what we know about three to five-year-olds. And if we think about um, the process that children go through when they acquire oral language and yeah. the adult role in that. Mm -hmm. And so when your child comes to you and they are babbling and we're so excited <laughs> and we're so encouraging and we're so accepting mm -hmm. of those um, initial attempts that don't look anything like the end result, but that we recognize as a valuable part of the process. And without our reaction, their trial and error learning, their attempts aren't going to continue mm -hmm. at yeah. nearly the same, the same rate. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, um, the environment that I would right. like to foster for our young writers. As sure, as sure. I think about devaluing, um, even unconsciously devaluing scribbling. You know, they're just, they're going through so much paper and they just put one mark on this and then they want another piece of paper. Um, we don't think that way about their early words. No. You know, like they're only using one word and then they just wander off. <laughs> we don't complain about that, but. Um, well, and their invented spelling or their first I attempt. I love invented at, spelling. Um, Yes, at writing words the way they sound, and it reveals so much that they know about phonics and about sound symbol relationship. And it is often a teachable moment, but it's not a um, a corrective moment uh -huh, uh -huh. with with them. And it's such a I, one of the things I love about invented spelling is you get such a glimpse into how they thought about it. Again, it's that process for them. It's such right. a it's like a snapshot of their thought process that you can't get in other areas of development. And language learning, I mean, oral, written, reading, writing, it is risky. I mean, uh, it's about, you know, you get an idea about how you think it works and mm -hmm. you try it out and then it's the feedback, it's the reaction as to whether or not you can continue right. what you're doing or you make adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, that's it's a really, it's a really good point. <laughs> And, and publishing it's, 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 gives them that opportunity. I mean, yeah. you know, to to make adjustments and to go on to extend and and, and further in a uh -huh. very positive, affirming way. Sure, and and might give us a clue about what other kinds of materials we should have around, or what other kinds of experiences or or ways we can extend um, what we see Definitely. is important to them in this moment, and what they're trying to tell us a story about or communicate to us. Um, 
I love the idea of thinking about it as publishing and um, just the way you've described. Um, I also love that you included a whole chapter called Playing with Prints. Um, a lot of the listeners of the show and, my, and myself were believers in play and defenders of play. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, why was it so important to devote a whole chapter to it? And what do you mean when you talk about play in terms of developing young writers? Um, I, I too <laughs> love and value children's play. Yeah. And that's one of the things I try to get across to uh, future teachers. It's not an either or, it's not play or learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, playing is how children learn to um, young children to a large extent. It's how they make sense of, um, of the world around them. Um, and so we need to create opportunities in their play where they have um, uh, exposure to print, where they have relevant, um, meaningful opportunities to use print to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's always the case, even in classrooms. And I feel like they are fewer now <laughs> than they were 20 years ago, even in classrooms where they still have centers and they call them learning centers, but I think we have learning centers for a small period of the day. And then we have a lot of um, whole group instruction or individual desk work. And um, for three, four and five-year-olds, especially, I see that interacting in the environment in um, intentionally prepared environments mm -hmm. as equally or more important than the direct direct instruction mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's the intentional preparation that ensures um I guess that they're learning and um you know I hear parents or novice teachers say things like um you know I have to set the timer and make them leave the block center because if they stay in blocks all day, then they're not ever reading or writing or doing math. And they are, if reading and writing and math are <laughs> intentionally <laughs> embedded in yes. the play. So it doesn't matter where they choose to play, if everywhere they are playing um, is providing the same opportunities that they need for learning yeah so I, I guess that's the point with with the writing and it seems again um like we're doing better with the reading um and so I just wanted to advocate strongly that we don't forget mm -hmm. that writing needs to be in there as well mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the expressive type of writing not the functional letter formation type of writing yeah I think about um and these are more I guess I guess so I'm just thinking about a, a, like a book my youngest wrote, quote unquote, you know, wrote when when they were um, maybe six, six years old, lots of, and it was who will be heart girl's friend. And it was really, it was like a wordless picture book. It just was this, this narrative of these two drawings and she, she glued it all. They glued it all together to bind it. And I think I have one in my box of childhood stuff from when I was a similar age about a, a dog. Um, and, and, you know, glued and it's sloppy. And, um, but I, I remember the pride of having that um, because books were important to me, even when I was little and to Josie when they were little. Um, and so to feel like I had created something that was similar um, was such a feeling of pride. And I remember I, I rem those, those memories came up for me as I was reading parts of, of the book, um, the emotion attached to it, I guess um is sort of what makes it so powerful what can make writing so powerful and I think um one of the classes I teach is children's literature and I love to read and especially love to read picture yeah. books um and I tend to put children's authors up on a pedestal <laughs> and um some more than others um and I do have a very profound respect for what they do but I also want children to realize that it's not elitist. I mean, uh -huh. um, 
we're all authors and we may not ever reach the same level of Mm -hmm. authorship, but um, anyone with a story to tell can write a book. Uh And so um, I think the story that you just shared about your daughter and the sense of self-satisfaction and accomplishment that came from sharing her story Uh is what we want them to experience. Um, For me, what's the the biggest disadvantage to the overemphasis on the functional side and, and learning how to write is that children learn how to write and they can write and they choose not to Yeah, because they don't like writing. (laughs) And so it's about that um, joy. And even if it isn't personally joyful for all of them, then at least a recognition um, that it's powerful to Uh be able to write and that it is something that is worthy of, their time and effort in doing. Yeah. That's a great framing um, because so many, you know, if you think about children of these, the age that we're talking about and they're in, especially the ones who go to childcare or go to preschool, it's not their choice to be there. They're part of a group. There's very limited options for power in those settings for them. And if you think about um, writing and communicating through writing, as a means of offering them some power uh, or an experience of power. I think that's really wonderful. And kind of the whole, um, uh, my whole journey with, with writing and with writing this book even started very long ago. Um, I was teaching kindergarten and my oldest son, who is currently a sophomore in college, (laughs) was four at the time. So I had a four-year-old and I had a one-year-old and just getting out of the house in the morning was an accomplishment. And then I would teach kindergarten all day. Um, And I was constantly making myself notes to try and remember everything that needed to be done. And um, my son asked me for a gray marker. He was making a picture at home. I was cooking dinner. He needed a gray marker. I didn't have one but I had one in my classroom at school. I've got Mm -hmm. the same set of markers. I'll bring it to you. You can finish your picture tomorrow. The next day I didn't bring the marker because (laughs) I completely forgot. Uh, Two or three days later, still didn't bring the marker. (laughs) Because that's how it works. Yeah. And in the book, um, there is a photograph of the now 20 year old posted note that my son wrote and attached to my keys that said gray marker. (laughs) And that is how the marker got home. And that was the beginning of his experience as a note writer and in writing. And this, this just very concrete realization that if I put it down on paper, I get results. Uh-huh. I've said it repeatedly and there was no mark. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> no, but I, I wrote her a note and she couldn't forget it. And the marker <laughs> appeared and, and that sticky note stayed with me through my very long journey of um, kind of perfecting my uh, philosophy on writing with children and, and yeah. sharing that with them. Yeah. And we, we hear about in, with reading and, and developing that element of literacy, letting children see you read. Um, and letting children see how reading is useful through their daily life, through your daily life. And, and what you've just described is kind of the same thing for writing. He'd seen you, you'd been what you call in your book, a writing role model for him with just notes that you weren't necessarily intending him to see as modeling maybe, but, but he had learned that, that power that way from watching you. And I do, you know, um, as you said, modeling and being a role model is very important. And um, if we think all the way back to Camborn's conditions for uh, language learning, again, whether it's oral or written, one of them is demonstration. Mm-hmm. They need to see how it works and what it looks like. And um, more so with writing than reading, um, it it's not as visible. I guess even if children are observing us right, um, they're observing like the back of the notepad that we're writing on yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. not um actually over our shoulder watching us form 
um, the words and the sentences on the page. And so anytime we can create those types of experiences with children, um, particularly in taking dictation, uh -huh. and I would encourage teacher that in teachers and parents, any adult, if you are going to um, take dictation, if you're going to serve as a scribe and record what the child is saying, write in a way that they can see the actual letters and words take shape on paper. Um, you know, they're learning the left to right progression. Mm -hmm. They might notice that some are bigger than others. And then you start a discussion about capitalization or um, a punctuation, you know, period mark or quotation mm -hmm. marks or whatever might occur more so um, in dictation than if they just happen to see it in a book. I think these are my words and this is what I'm saying. And what's that mark? It, and how does it relate to what I just said? Mm -hmm. It's that personal um, connection that um, it makes them more attuned, I guess, to the yeah. detail of it. Yeah, you mentioned. Interested. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that one of the developmental considerations we need to take into perspective is that they are in sort of an egocentric stage. So if we can make that connection between their words and what you're doing and they sort of have the power now that they're making you write this stuff down i yeah. think that is another um meaningful element um to modeling you know i i i hadn't thought much about whether they see it over my shoulder or from the back of the notepad uh, you know as long they saw i was writing and i was talking about what i was writing but they weren't actually seeing that process a lot of the time so Thing that take place. And the same thing if it's um, if it's being typed, you know, if you're on a keyboard, but if they're seeing it as it appears on the screen, I think, and as it takes shapes, um, it, it just provides them with an additional layer of mm -hmm. information, mm -hmm. insight. Yeah. Um, we added is the preschool that I was in um, for the last few years. We it was a it was in a speech language hearing department at a college, so we were a speech and language clinic um, doing preschool with graduate students in there. And uh, I brought in like three of my husband's super old laptops, like clunky, ginormous, heavy laptops, to put into our dramatic play. And they 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 turned it into, I expected them to do like some office pretending, but they turned it into like writing letters home to mom and 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 talking about um their day while they were still at the preschool and letting letting mom know what was happening. And um we just we just don't know what's important to them until we start to watch and listen and see the ways that they use the tools, I guess. Um, in the ways that you're describing and, and you give so many good examples in the book. The last thing that I want that I was planning to ask about was the environmental print. Um, because my, my, I don't want to say struggle, that's too strong, but, um, I think there's a fine line between environmental print and visual clutter in our classrooms sometimes. And we've seen, some some studies and things come out about how visual clutter can be distracting for children and too many things on the walls is more of a distraction than a benefit. Um, so when you talk about environmental print, what's important in your mind? Um, that it's meaningful <laughs> and that it serves a purpose. So I was teaching in the day where they said labels are good. And so we went and window, Everything was labeled, door, yeah. lunchbox. Um, I mean, yes. anything that wasn't moving had a word <laughs> stuck to it and I think that was a little bit of um sensory overload uh -huh. um but if it is um providing direction so like you don't uh hang a sign that says glue just to name the object but if it is showing them where on the shelf to return the glue bottle in the art center after they used it mm -hmm. or um maybe um uh, uh, directions and whether it's rebus or words um how to the tape dispenser i think is one that kids struggle with so you know like tearing the tape off the end uh, yeah and yeah. so if there if there are some directions that go next to the tape dispenser so it's not just labeling it as a thing but it is actually serving a purpose which is um, helping them 
use it effectively and at the same time um, teaching them that pr provides information and it, yeah. is, it is a source of information for us. Um, so I think there does need to be a balance. Um, the print that we place in the environment intentionally. And then I also think that there's going to be environmental print that just occurs naturally. Mm. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was teaching kindergarten and we did journal writing um, and we did journal writing every day and there would be one or two topics or anything else that the children could write about. And I noticed that the girls that sat closest to where the lunchbox were stored started writing about Barbie in their journal and the I and Barbie had a flower for the dot over the I and the B and Barbie looked like the script on the Barbie lunchbox which oh, wow. was right next to them <laughs> and so um it was print that they found in the environment that both gave them a topic for writing but also served as a model like uh -huh. for spelling and for letter formation of, of that writing. So I do think it, it serves a very uh, valuable purpose in being there. Um, I just think that we need to be selective and to be uh -huh. mindful that um, more is it necessarily better. Yeah. And if we do choose to add it, if we choose to put a label, it doesn't mean it has to stay the entire school year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like maybe some names on things for the first couple uh -huh. of weeks, but then those can come down and they could be replaced with um, calendars or uh, schedules, more um, purposeful print mm -hmm. in the environment that does more of relaying a message than just uh, being there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and remembering maybe too, that these are pre-readers so just putting it there doesn't really make the connection without us also saying what it means or using the words or what letting them see us write it and we're talking about what we're writing and why we're putting it up there and i think you you talk about that in the book of course <laughs> you also have to sort of bridge a little bit and offer that scaffolding exactly um i'm thinking in particular about a non-native english speaker um a student that i had in a uh, kindergarten and um when we would journal write and I would encourage him you know to do um phonetic spelling or to draw pictures but he was um very intelligent and he was also um a little bit on the perfectionist side <laughs> so he knew pictures were not writing and oh. um, he knew that scribble wasn't words uh -huh. and so he just took to copying classroom rules, um, <laughs> any text that he could find in the environment because he wanted real writing. So although I was very accepting of different forms of writing, um, he wasn't content with anything other than correct. Mm -hmm. And so he's, you know, it was there for him to copy and it kind of became a, a support system for him. Um, and he was copying things that he could read. And then he started um, making the connection between the words that he could now read and write and how they sounded in sight words. And he kind of, he built from that. Uh -huh. But for him in particular, the environmental print was very important. Yeah. And he, he was um, very dependent on that. Yeah. Yeah. We've definitely had um, in our, in the preschool, um, a couple children who were like that they were just looking for way, ways they could find those models because they wanted to copy it down and it was children's names a lot of times it was the other children's names that were really relevant and valuable and meaningful to those two boys that I'm thinking of right now um so we just you know we provided those models and and we didn't have to do a whole lot more the materials were there and um but not everyone was interested so I wasn't going to sit everybody down and have this right. we're going to learn how to write everybody's name kind of thing but but you individualize like we do everywhere else take what we're observing about a child's interests and uh skills and support it in that way 
in, in whatever way we can. And it is very um, individual. Um, the, the process, it may be identical or the same for each child, but the rate at which they move through the mm. various stages or phases of understanding is definitely influenced by environmental and genetic mm. factors. And um, I, I think it is so important that, again, going back to Camborn and his conditions, that we have this expectation that we realize that every child, barring some kind of um, documented mental or physical mm -hmm. uh, situation need every child can and will be successful in learning mm -hmm. uh, to read and write as long as we keep doing the things that we know they need to be successful and we keep supporting them um and we keep in encouraging and modeling and we don't um get panicked that mm. you know they they're not spelling the words correctly or they're not punctuating their sentences and then we make <laughs> we get into this repetitive drill and and yeah. um trying to speed up the process I guess and yeah. I can't say enough about their need to learn through discovery and exploration through trial and error um just in an affirming way it's those initial experiences with writing that are going to help form the attitudes about writing that last into teenage and adult years. Mm -hmm. And so if the initial experiences can be positive and affirming, um, then we're setting them on the right path for long-term success. Mm -hmm. And I really think writing more than anything else is what our society uses in many situations, in academic, in um, careers, to, to judge um, yeah. a person's intellect or um, work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about all the college essays my children are writing right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> They've got a lot of emphasis on uh, whether or not you can communicate in Burnett. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going back to, you, you know, you just talked about discovery and exploration. Um, and things like that. And I think there are some folks working with young children who that makes them very uncomfortable because their idea of being a teacher is to be the group leader or the activity leader. Um, and, you know, there are times when we may step into those roles, but the majority of what we do is exactly what you described with the block corner. Um, you know, the, we're, the one little child, the one child who wants to play in the blocks and the teacher's concerned that there's no math, he's not going to learn math there, or he's not going to learn writing there. So we need to bring it there um, and we need to, we need to be, you know, you talked about intentionally setting up those, those materials and situations. And um, I feel like that's what this whole book does is give us that permission, but also instruction in how to um, offer this important stuff. Of course, it's important for children to, to learn these things and have these experiences, but to do it in a way that's not um, top down from the teacher all the time. Uh, so, so I'm really excited about passing it along to college students that I'm working with. And, um, uh, so I, what, is there anything else you hoped that you would get to say about the book or about your, about the work that I haven't asked? Um, no, not <laughs> yeah, it's so, okay if there isn't, <laughs> I guess in, um, in my mind, and again, in my purpose for writing was, um, like you said, to be um, instructive, but also, um, I hope it's somewhat motivational. I think mm -hmm. the graphic designers did a great job and with the pictures and with the colors. Yeah. And um, it is a beautiful book. I'll just, one, I know you've got it behind you, but here it is. It, you realize um, the need, again, and the importance of creating a type of classroom that supports young children as writers, mm -hmm. as authors, and all that they do um, throughout, throughout the day. And then just some possible suggestions and ideas and much like learning to write itself, it's trial and error and uh -huh. some things will work and some things won't. And the things that work great this year 
won't next year because you have different children. A whole new group. Yes. <laughs> so we Such just keep point. talking about it and learning from each other Yeah, and going from there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Again, the book is called The Young Writer's World, Creating Early Childhood Classrooms Where Authors Abound. It's published by Exchange Press. Um, and, and listeners know what a fan I am of Exchange Press. <laughs> so um, so um, I'm appreciative to them for bringing the book into the world as, and to you for doing that too. And for being on the show. Um, I think that this is going to be a good conversation for folks to listen to. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Rebecca. And thank you everybody for listening. Come back again for another episode of that early childhood nerd.